Welcome to the NZ Everyday Investor. I'm your host, Arce Angaro, and I'm joined in the studio by Ralph Stewart, the CEO and founder of, I'm going to hopefully get this right this time, <laughs> of Lifetime Retirement Income. Darcy Perfect, and Phew. thank you. Thank you very much. That was really hard for me to get the order of that right. It's kind of circa 2007, uh, KiwiSaver comes along, and it was quite a fright for the local industry, because it brought about a lot of tax changes to the structure of investment products. Uh, a thing called a portfolio investment entity was launched in New Zealand, yeah, pie, yeah. which is the modern pie, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that forced a lot of the old insurers like AXA to build new systems okay. uh, to be able to join the KiwiSaver program. Okay. I was heading our backs at the time and didn't have the money. It was going to cost about $20 million. Uh, AXA is a French company. So, so that began a sequence of events that kind of led to where we are today. Okay. We got shot over to Paris, where we often went to, to get told off for not doing well. Yeah, well, yeah. Whatever we did well, asked to do more. Yeah, being told off by a Frenchman. What, what's that like? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just guessing. <laughs> There's a lot of language. There's yeah. a lot of language. I can understand. I know where you're coming from. Yeah, no, well, you, you, you've been there, mate, so oh, yeah. it's, it's good. Definitely. Um, but on that particular occasion, when I was there looking for reasonably large capital for New Zealand, not so mm. much for, for AXA in France, yeah. to effectively allow us to invest in the KiwiSaver program and become a default provider. Yeah. The French couldn't understand why New Zealand was so late to the savings for retirement gain. Hmm. And I heard a lot more about products that were used in retirement than saving for retirement. Over right. in Europe and North America as well, I guess they're very, very, very equipped and mature in that space of actually distributing the, the capital exactly. in retirement, spending money for Correct. you know helping people spend money rather than accumulate, whereas in New Zealand we're just getting woken up to the whole accumulation Correct. stuff. Correct. Okay. And there's clear reason for that. You know, the, the French right. and the rest of the world do not have mighty New Zealand superannuation. Interesting. So, this, so I guess that's a good example of how when it's done for you, you just don't innovate yourself. Spot on. Spot on. Okay. So the deal with uh, with Exa Paris for New Zealand and KiwiSaver was, mm. yes, Ralph, you can have this money, but you have to build a post-retirement guaranteed income product at the same time. Okay. So that's where it all began, really. Is that right? So it was kind of like a mandate. It from, was. From the French. In fact, it was an order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay. Um, so, so we got on with that. Uh, I spent a fair bit of time with AXA in Europe and the US and Japan learning how to do that. Yeah. And we began to build a product called Evergreen in New Zealand. Okay. Uh, and about, it was 2007, uh, about 2011, uh, AXA got restless with Australia and New Zealand and ultimately decided too That's small. Right. Yeah. Uh, so they sold to AMP, so we never launched Evergreen. Is that right? So it was kind of all ready to go, but it just never saw the light of day. Correct. Okay. So that, that really stuck with me. I could see the opportunity. And you did a lot of the groundwork, arguably, right? Correct. A lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge. Right. It just wasn't Correct. implemented. Correct. What a shame. So in 2013, before you could actually trade, you had to go through dealings with the FMA and Correct. the Reserve Bank. So do you want to talk, talk, talk me through that? Of course. Thank you, Darcy. Um, the, the Evergreen piece was really trying to get our heads around product design. Yeah. Because guaranteeing someone's income for life, it's not easy. Right. You know, how long you're going to live, what investment market's going to do. It's, it's quite a complex mathematical structure. Right. So my time at AXA those last years, we were learning about that. Yeah. So then AXA left. Um, then the next stage we would have gone to was seeking regulatory approval. Sure. So we started that in 20, late 2012, early 13. Yeah. And that was a case of basically crashing on the door of the Reserve Bank, the IRD and the FMA and saying, hey, listen, there's not enough opportunity here. Yeah. These retired people have got so few options. Can we do something? Yeah. You know, at times I think I thought I was an idiot. <laughs> I guess, but I, I, at the same, well, sorry, you said it, not me. <laughs> but I'm just thinking um, the one thing that always rings true when I read uh, stuff out there, I always just reference the fact that with the FMA, they're, they have a mandate to actually promote innovation. Yes. And a lot of people might not realize that. They just think that the FMA is there with a big stick yes. waiting to punish you when you make a mistake. But really... It's, it's also there to promote innovation and encourage flexibility and all that sort of stuff. Oh. So they, they actually want you to approach them with, with, when it's, something's fully baked, you know, with an idea and, and solve a problem that's out there. So they must have been, I, I guess, fairly open to, to the concept, right? I mean, Darcy, it's su such a good point um, on, on a couple of levels. Uh, so the first was, yes, they have a mandate for innovation. Right. So, so they're prepared to entertain ideas. Yeah. Um, and. I think the industry thought I was a bit of an idiot because right. entertaining ideas is not necessarily approving ideas. Okay. So, so there was a fair bit of... Let's have a conversation, but I'm not going to say I agree with that. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's good. Okay. Uh, more so probably for the Reserve Bank than the FMA because after the finance company collapse, 
Sure. Um, there's, there's a lot of fear and concern about yeah. the nature of regulation. Because that would have only been a few years afterwards, what, four or five years afterwards, Great. where all that stuff was going down. Great. You rock up with something quite... Great. Guarantees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best time, but no. it's still, they, they didn't shut the door, did they? Well, to your point, Darcy, I was overwhelmed with the willingness to consider. That's good. Okay. Um, Financially, it, it became a real challenge um, because I was doing this by myself at that time. Right. And the message was quite clear that, yep, let, let's have a crack at this. But I'm thinking, okay, we'll get this done in 12 months. Yes. Uh, Reserve Bank saying, we should be able to do this in three years. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> they weren't quite working with your timeline, were they? Correct. No, that's, okay. Maybe that's the best way to frame this is what is the problem that, that you guys are trying to solve? Yep. Yeah. Um, the first thing is is for retired people, trust and confidence, Darcy, is, is just everything. Sure. Uh, the involvement uh, of the regulatory environment in New Zealand, at its kindest, has yeah. been a little slow. Right, yeah. <laughs> As a consequence, the last 30 or 40 years is littered with train crashes. Okay, right. So, so it's no surprise that retired community are very nervous, yeah. scared, and gun shy. Yeah. So first step in the journey is, is there a financial solution for the private sector that could add genuine value to retired people? Good. And, and we thought there was by giving them more security over their regular income. Gotcha. Next stage was to try and kind of separate the thinking between a living income yeah. and investing in retirement. Okay. And we just focused down on that gap between New Zealand superannuation and a lifestyle in New Zealand. Right. So just thinking about the, the base level base of income. Base level. Gotcha. You know, groceries, petrol, rates, insurance, just that space. Right. Because we're not talking necessarily about... Because we're talking about a, a variable annuity, and um, you know, looking at that as just a financial product in and of itself, right away when I was kind of looking into this, I was thinking, well, what's what's the rate of return? Is that how does that compare with this? But I think I'm, I missed the point. I, I have my blinders on. It's it's not so much about investing in something; it's about providing an income later correct. on, which which takes away a lot of the concerns that people would have at that age, right? Darcy, correct. We just went about to say to somebody, all right, every Super Tuesday. Yeah. We will supplement your NZ Super. Yeah. And just like NZ Super, no matter how long you live, the payment will continue. Gotcha. Stop. Simple. Yeah. yeah. We're not investing in anything yeah. crazy. This isn't anything, you know. Correct. That's going to require a lot of active management and for you to get your head around. And Correct. Go, go and see some growing ups for that. Yeah, that's right. Go and see some growing ups for that. <laughs> so what are the current solutions to – actually, and, and just going back to the, the, the problem first, I guess – Retirement poverty, that's a real thing, right? We're, we're, we're dealing with that now in New Zealand. Would you agree? Correct. Uh, one of the unintended consequences that we've experienced uh, was the obvious opportunities for retired income for maturing KiwiSavers. Okay. So when we did our business case, we assumed we'd be there to help people who got to 65 with a KiwiSaver balance, yeah. assess their income needs, and if they wanted to, use that to supplement their income. Right. What we've actually found is in the last couple of years, the buyers of lifetime have been the current retired community. Interesting. All are mm -hmm. suffering that income gap between NZ Super and what they actually spend. And I'm going to guess, because this is a different generation than me, they have potentially they have money, maybe it's in term deposits or savings, they're, they might be debt free, but they're so scared to do anything other than what they know, and they assume that interest rates will always be high and they'll yep. eventually get a better return on their term deposit. but. You, you thought that it would come from KiwiSaver, but it's actually coming from underneath the mattress of all these retired people in New Zealand. Correct. It, it's, it's the current retired community. Right. Um, okay. I, I think there's a wee bit of a misnomer around uh, the retirement community are very wealthy and rich, and it, it, it's a good place to be. That is not the case, Darcy. Right. You yeah. know, 600,000 retired people in New Zealand today, yeah. you know, 10, 12, 15% at best uh, have a reasonable amount of capital. Half of those might be able to use their capital loan to live off. Yeah. The other half might take a little bit off. That's shocking. Only a few. So the, the the vast majority of people that are retired right now would be receiving NZ Super and maybe a little bit a little bit extra, hopefully, from, Correct. from some sort of interest or a little bit of capital Correct. that they're eroding. But Correct. they they would be probably anxious about spending any more of that money because they, they want to make sure it would last, right? Oh, Darcy, again, it, we, we do lots of seminars. We talk to literally thousands of retired people. Yeah. And one of the things I just picked up on seminars is during the seminar process, yeah. Sometimes the presenters give the audience permission to spend. Yeah, that's right. Because they're terrified yeah. to do it. That's right. <laughs> Which might be a bit of a revelation for some, right? Completely. Kind of. But I get it. As far as um, you know, you if you've ever gone away on a trip and you you've got some cash out and you've got some supplies or whatever it is, whether it's camping or whatever, you, there's always this anxiety that it's not going to last for the rest of the exactly. trip. Exactly. 
and for that generation in particular, being different from, say, my generation, that even more so because they were raised in a different environment. So that would be a huge problem for a lot of New Zealanders. That they might even be, I guess, voluntarily making themselves into voluntarily poor, right? They've got the assets, but they just don't spend it. So in reality, it is, it's like they have nothing. There, yeah. there is no doubt, and it's, it's almost, you know, it, it's on three or four fronts. One is, as you say, as they're getting older, they genuinely worry. Yeah. Healthcare costs are rising much faster than when they were, you know, saving for retirement. Yeah. Because they're older. That's right. Lower interest rates continually declining. It's pretty tough out there. That's right. And from you know, most of my clients that I deal with, lower interest rates, fantastic, bring it on. <laughs> but you know, your clients are very much at the other end of the spectrum where the lower the interest rates go, they just take another pay cut. Correct. And so it's a destructive Correct. trend, but it doesn't seem to be returning anytime soon. Correct. So the problem, I guess, for people that are just about entering into retirement or they newly retired is I guess they're also thinking around, well, if this trend does continue, I'm not really going to get any rate of return from term deposits and fixed interest, or nothing meaningful really, right? Correct. Uh, sort of t two bridges that we ask them to consider crossing. The first is because most New Zealanders will need to draw down their capital in retirement to generate income, yeah. that's a bit of an obstacle. What do you mean I've got to spend my capital? When interest rates are less than 2%, you just have to. That's right. <laughs> so crossing that bridge is first. Yeah. Uh, and the second bit is, as you said earlier, it's okay to spend. Correct. If you plan your income and you've got some surplus capital, go use it. That's right. And I think you know, most of our listeners would have parents that they'd probably encourage them to spend money and have a good life. They don't, you know, they don't necessarily exactly. expect an inheritance or need an inheritance necessarily. But I, I think for that generation, again, that might be really hard because they might struggle with with that, they wanted to live off the proceeds of their capital because that's probably what they thought when they were accumulating that yes. they would do. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, and they want to leave. They want to leave the capital behind to their the kids, right? So that's that's exactly. a that's a big bridge for them to, to cross, I suspect. I mean, again, unintended consequences. Excuse me, consequences yeah. and learning. Um, early 2013, we did focus groups all around New Zealand. Yeah. So we talked to retired people and just a casual atmosphere about what was important about retirement. Yeah. And one of the beliefs that we held at that time uh, was having some money left over for the kids at the end would be important. Right. Categorically, it was the opposite. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's not that's, that's right. actually a bit of a myth then. Correct. So that generation actually is, they're more than comfortable. If, if, if the kids get the house, that, that'd be great. Yeah. Or if they get nothing, that's great because I've given them an education and a life. Great. Okay. Good on you, old people of New Zealand. Keep it up. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Living it up. <laughs> so the um, the current solutions then. So tell me about what some of the current solutions are right now to help retired people to actually yes. you know yes. get get an income in retirement. Totally. It's pretty sad. It's a pretty short story to us. Oh, is right? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a shorter episode, I suspect. Okay, that's all right. Let's say I'm age 68. I'm 17. I got a hundred thousand yeah. dollars, and I'm trying to generate some extra income yeah. that supplements New Zealand super. Okay. So first problem is the investment products available. Do not pay regular income on Super Tuesday. Okay, right. So, so first thing I can't do. Right. So next step is okay. What about a term deposit? Everybody knows those. They were designed as investment vehicles, not as retirement income vehicles. Right. So they don't pay every Super Tuesday. Right. I think the best you can do with a bank is maybe monthly. Right. Gotcha. Maybe. Gotcha. And the shortest period you can lock in is obviously 30 days, 60 days, 90 days a year. Yeah. If your circumstances change in that year for any reason, you'll lose the interest anyway. That's right. Common problem. <laughs> so, so that doesn't help much. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't solve the principal problem if you still are totally exposed to what the interest rates will be next year. Correct. And if they're less than they were in the previous year, rates have still gone up. Yeah. What am I going to do? That's right. Cost of living still goes up. So, yep. so it crashes that. Yeah. I could use my KiwiSaver or I could use a managed fund and take a regular drawdown. Right. So 100000 there, I draw down $5,000 a year. Yeah. That's all cool. And you can do that. Yep. It's same problem. Let's say you're, you're 60 out of 69, it's $100,000. You'll probably live till you're close to your 90. I see where you're going with this. So if you divide your 100,000 by the 28 years, yeah. what if you live longer? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't solve that. That's right. You'll die too soon or you'll live too long. Those are the common you things that we see. Yeah. Okay. So the other big one is rental properties. Okay. So a lot of people in that age bracket have got used to rental properties and had them in their 40s and 50s and still got them. Yeah. You know, as you get older, a bit of work, I'm managing tenants, the phone's ringing, the tap's not going, all that good stuff, finding new tenants. Um, some of the new tenancy laws are pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, but probably the principal issue is the damn thing's not liquid. That's right. 
I need a hip operation. I've got to sell the house. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> How's that going to work? It'd be great if you could just sell the front deck, though. Totally. It's just a hip. <laughs> <laughs> totally, Darcy. Yeah. Um, and more recently, in the last sort of five years, you've seen the emergence of home equity release products, mm. uh, which are gaining a little bit of traction. Mm. Um, but, Some people seem to support them more than others, yeah. Yes, yeah. but controversial. Yeah, yeah, I t- totally agree. Um, I say. Yeah. In our view, there, there are better models in our view. Yeah. Um, accruing interest over time for an unknown period of time. It's all ca- ca- um, capitalizing, but in the wrong side. Correct. Yep. It, it could be catastrophic. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Europe in particular, uh, where people that don't have the crazy home ownership and desire that New Zealanders do yeah. tend to rent for life. Yeah. So they have different equity release structures which don't involve debt. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's better ways it can be done, I believe. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that, and that's you've basically just described the current landscape in terms of the available solutions for people. That's who are it, retired. Darcy. And that's it. That's it. It's not that exciting, is it? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and, I got pretty say. tough. <laughs> yeah. And this, you know, and this podcast, I've been, it's it's fantastic. It's part of my continuing education. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning a, a lot. But what I what I am learning is that there seems to be. A lot of innovation in the um, in the startups, in the in the fintech sector, in this exciting sort of realm. Yes, you know, angel angel investing and all that sort of stuff. And I wonder if a lot of that is is partly a, a side effect of low interest rates, where there's not a lot of other spicy investment opportunities. Yes. So there seems to be a lot more flowing into very high risk ventures. But it's either that or it's very safe. There doesn't seem to be anything in the middle. And I wonder if um, most New Zealand's uh, problems lie in the middle. You know, they they need yes. something that's kind of it's got a it's a very predictable. It's very safe. It's it's nothing too complicated about it, but it, it's going to work. Um, there's not a lot of options. So yeah, apart from sell the home and then just put the money in the bank and slowly erode it, which isn't Completely. very interesting. Then you've got to look to other things. So enter in your solution. So tell us a little bit about how it works. Yep. So for, uh, as as you mentioned earlier, had had the evergreen experience yep. uh, back in sort of two thousand seven, eight, nine, ten space. Yep. Uh, so, so that embedded some some of the simple logic around how this stuff works because it's fundamentally actuarial science. Okay. Um, then went through the regulatory process, um, and that forces to think pretty hard about you know New Zealand uniquely. Yeah. So a lot, lifetime is driven by a rate of return from a mix of assets. Yeah. And ensuring an income to last a lifetime. So in other words, mortality. Okay. So those two things. So if sp- split that up into those two bits, then. So yep. the, um, the the first part in terms of how the you know the, the funds are allocated, yep. it's not going to be all um, you know cash and, and fixed interest. We're talking about a bit more balance, right? Spot on. Um, in in North America and in Japan, the, these things are prevalent. In North America, you know, trillions of dollars go into these things. That's right. Um, yep. So asset allocation is, is driven by an individual's desire for risk. We felt in the New Zealand context that was too complicated. So we don't offer choice. So lifetime's asset allocation is half in growth assets okay. and half in income assets. Okay. Stop. No more. You have to have that. Right. Simple. Simple. Okay. Reason for that is it manages risk, but also, as you quite rightly have said, keeps the message simple. Gotcha. Gotcha. So if um, if interest rates continue, will, you know, continue their death march towards zero, chances are property and equities will Other probably assets. continue to do well. So it's, helps to compensate. it's not going to be too complicated here. Okay. On the longevity side, mm. uh, that was a lot harder. Yeah, because um, we're talking about insurance, right? So you, you're, you're, you're getting these insurance actuaries on the job, and they're designing correct. how it's going to work. Because you take, what, the average age that people are going to die, and then well, do some get, maths around that? I'm sure there's a bit more to it. No, no, it's, Darcy, you're on it. But right. the first problem we encountered, actually, the investment side, if I can say easy, yeah. was the, the least hard okay. <laughs> of the things to solve. Okay, Longevity proved really hard. Um, Longevity is, is a function of someone's life, right? And yeah. you use mortality tables to work that out. Yeah. And New Zealand mortality tables are, are fine, yeah. but they're not. They don't have large histories. New Zealand's a young country. Right. So we we went to other countries where they have guaranteed income products, yeah. and those products are included in mortality tables. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah. for example, in America, we actually found people who had died who had guaranteed income products. <laughs> Oh, okay. So that was easy Supreme to test it. Yeah. yeah. So we did all that, uh, UK, US, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Yeah. Created the tables, did the data. What do you reckon we found? Why don't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and look, it's, it's the absolute truth. Uh, but people who bought guaranteed income in those sorts of countries tend to be better educated, better social economic nice. class, right. better health care, right. better food. Yeah, yeah. Surprise, surprise, yeah. they live a lot longer. So that's interesting, eh? Because I've often, uh, and I've said this just joking, I haven't actually ever seen this, but with people who are taking out, say, life insurance, 
or trauma insurance, which pays out when you get diagnosed with something nasty. If they um, if they take out the policy, they're probably statistically they're probably in that group of people that will live longer and be healthier. So it's like you take out the insurance, right. and automatically that means you're never going to die, Great. which of course is true. Right. <laughs> but it's funny how there's that correlation Correct. Right, between selection the mortality risk. rates. Yeah, selection Great. risk. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as a result of that, um, the Reserve Bank, you, they give you conditions. Okay. So Lifetime had a bunch of conditions. And one of the conditions was we had to assume that a New Zealander would live about 20% longer than another insurer would consider them to live for. 20% longer. Okay. Yep. So that's pushing it out. Yep. Yeah. Put that in numbers. Uh, female age 65, live to 89. We have to provide income for her to live to 94. Wow. Okay. Which might might be, you know, who knows, as, as we get fitter and healthier and totally. eat less burgers, maybe that will happen. Who knows? <laughs> who knows, right? Well, if, if you're up for it, um, the, 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 there's a strong thematic out there, if that's the modern word, okay. that you know everyone's living longer. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, so we've got to be careful. And Ralph, how can this lifetime thing work? Everyone lives to 110, so on and so forth. That's right. Actual mortality experience, as you and I sit today, is internationally declining. That's right, yeah. And it is burgers, it is obesity, and it's use of drugs. So you know, armed, armed with all of this, effectively what we're doing is we've um, somebody puts a bunch of money in, and they've got a guaranteed income for life, and presumably there's insurance that sits amongst us where this effectively is insurance to ensure that they will get that. And if you live to 96, you're going to win, right? Because Great. you're getting all of your capital back, but Great. you're also going to get insurance for those years that you Great. lived over and above the average age. Great. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Okay. So I, cause I did this um, on the calculator this morning. I did this uh, this worksheet where if, if I was 65 years old, I put a half a million dollars into this, I would get... What, what does it work out to be? $25,000 a year, $961 a fortnight. Yep. And if I died at 91 years old, I would um, I'd effectively get, be getting a 2.11% return on that, which as an investment policy might look at that and go, oh, that's, that's, that's rubbish, we can do better, and yada, yada, yada. But the, the real point here is that if I keep on living, if I went to, say, age 100, thinking really optimistically and no more donuts, that's 35 years, then the rate of return obviously jumps up quite a bit because you're using the insurance side of yep. it, right? Yep. Is that? Uh, am I getting this right? You, you are. It, it, the IIR or the internal rate of return is a little higher than two point one one, but not that much more. Not wrong right. at all. Okay. But the point is, it's after fees and taxes. That's right. Find something else in New Zealand that will do that. That's right. And guarantee it for life, and have it liquid. There you go. go Darcy, yeah. where is one? Go find me one. <laughs> Well, and why hasn't it been possible for overseas providers to just come into New Zealand and just launch one of theirs? Yep. Um, I think I, it's the same problem I encountered at AXA. I mean, New Zealand is still a relatively small market. Yeah. When you combine Australia and New Zealand together, it gets a bit better. Yeah. But, you know, if you're a large global insurer, it's pretty small beer. Right. So New Zealand alone is pretty tough. Um, right. And for so many years, we've had Mighty NZ Super. It's just never been on the radar. Sure. Because it's been state provided. Gotcha. It's really only been the, you know, the involvement of KiwiSaver that's created this need. Right. It would be great to have it for older people anyway, but without yeah. KiwiSaver coming through, the economics would have been hard. Right, understood. Okay. And how does the how does the offering that you guys have in New Zealand, how does that differ to, say, in, in the United States? Yep. You, you alluded to one of them before where you could potentially choose asset allocation, yes. whereas with, with your product here in New Zealand, it's set and forget. Um, from a fees-based point of view, are we is it more affordable in New Zealand or yep. is it? Yeah, do you want to talk, talk to that? Thank you. Um, yeah, quite deliberate about trying to you know, build lifetime for New Zealand. Okay. So it's distinctly different from a North American model, Japanese model, uh, an English model, yeah. in that one, as you've said, the asset allocation is fixed, so we can't play with it. Yeah. To these products have tend to be sold quite quite heavily by the advisory community in, the, in those areas, Yeah. which has required quite heavy commissions. Right, gotcha. And they need okay. to be recovered if the person cancels the policy early, mm. so they pretty large exit fees sure okay gotcha. so didn't want to do any of that so we don't have any of that right um, you don't pay uh, commissions to advisors to very small amount right one okay. fifth of one percent oh is that right okay it's just like an ongoing servicing yes. commission so yep. similar to I guess a, a, a life insurance person selling a policy there'll be a very small re Correct. renewal right so Correct. that they can service it and, and provide ongoing Correct. advice to the, to the customer okay Give an example. A North American example would be an equivalent. Could be seven percent up front and one percent a year. Whoa. Okay. So, so that, that has a big impost on the investor. Right. So it's really expensive insurance. Is all Great. that is. Great. Yeah. Great. Wow. wow. Okay. So, so that comes out. Okay. 
in the construct of the products in the other parts of the world, sometimes it's harder to get liquidity. Okay. So you get you might be in it for ten years and you lose the right to get access to your capital. Right. Didn't want any of that. It's a lifetime's access to your capital for the lifetime. Okay. Um, so in, in a contrast sense, the, the product that most looks most like New Zealand's product is you'll be familiar with Vanguard. Yes. In Transamerica, I'm sure in, in, in New York. Okay. That they have a van, uh, variable annuity like ours. Right. Which is very, very similar in design, no loads, access right. to your capital, similar asset allocation. And I think it's got about, not, not a trillion, but you know, billions of dollars invested right. in it. Okay. And it sells for 1.95%. Okay. Lifetime sells for 2.35%. Okay. So it's, it's pretty analogous to that. Pretty proud of that. Yeah, well done. Good on you. I, I suspect that in New Zealand it just wouldn't fly otherwise, right? Great. Great. Yeah. It's got to be. It's got to be right. So it's a pretty lean operation, I suspect. It is. Yeah. So in terms of how to kind of, and I'm going to just throw this this in there just to make sure that everybody's on board with what this is as a, as a financial instrument. Okay. Am I correct in assuming it's kind of like the inverse of a mortgage, where, um, you know, instead of getting a big chunk of money from the bank and then you pay 30 years worth of small incremental payments back to the bank. It's kind of the opposite, right? Uh, yes. Somebody would be giving you, say, half a million dollars, and then they would get incremental payments for life until the capital's run out. Yes. So that's kind of that's the annuity bet. Yes. And then what we're talking about is overlaying that with insurance, so that it's it's guaranteed to pay out for life. So if you right. so it's it's a kind of like a single single premium type yep. thing, right? No, does it's good. I I simply explain it. You know, if interest rates, are, as they are in New Zealand, 1.75 for cash rates as they stand today, you know, less let, some tax, it just doesn't work for anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a retiree's capital's got to work. Yeah. So first thing is, they're in a balanced fund, it's grinding away, and it's going to do better than that. Yeah. How much better? You know, maybe 2 3 4% if we're lucky. Gotcha. But but it's still getting some meaningful returns. Right. That gets credited to our investors' account. Yeah. And they can do what they like with the capital, put some more in, take it out, go and get a hip operation, take the cruise, whatever. And is it expensive to, to draw, draw it out? Like if I need no 10 fees, grand? No fees. No, no fees at all. So, no, I, so I need 10 grand for my hip. Done. Take it out. Gotcha. And it changes, obviously, the income that you're going to get for the remainder of your days. Correct. correct. Yeah, of course. Correct. Um, but apart from that, it's not like you're charging 3% on the way correct. out. Correct. Correct. It's real easy. It's right. just, just like a KiwiSaver account. Right. Put some money in, take some out, get some investment returns. Yeah. Then we say to the investor, well, okay, you've got some regular income coming out. Yeah. Would you like to insure that for the rest of your life? Gotcha. If the answer is yes, that has a premium attached. Oh, so you can do either or? Uh, we, we link the two together. Oh, you link the two together. Okay. Um, and the premium comes out of the account, offsets the investment returns, yeah. and gives them an account balance at the end of the year. Gotcha. Okay. So very transparent. And if the market tanks, tell us about that. So let's yeah. just say there's a, there's a black swan event and you know fixed interest yep. and equities go down at the same time. Yep. Um, it's absolute Armageddon. Talk us through that. This is where the actuarial science comes in. So I'm going to try and use a triangle to, to explain this. Sure. So the first thing we've got to do is we've decided we've got a balanced fund. So what are the expected returns for those assets over the last 20 or 30 years? And the sum of those assets is about 6.5%. Okay. One corner of the triangle, 65 Okay. Okay. At 6.5%, at age 65, what's the drawdown rate that we could use yeah. that would draw that capital down against that investment return over at least the life of the individual? Gotcha. So next corner of the triangle, we put in at 65, 5%. Right. That's cool, but all this has got to be paid for. <laughs> so how much are you going to charge? Gotcha. Because that's going to come off the capital depreciation rate. Gotcha, okay. So we put that in the other corner of the triangle. Right, okay. Triangle of love. <laughs> I'm stretching it there, I'm sure. <laughs> nice no, good. So then with our key features of the triangle, yeah. then we test that in about 10,000 different scenarios. Okay. So what if we got the investment returns wrong? What if we paid out too much? What if we charged too much? And we don't do this, obviously. The actuaries do this. Yeah. And it cranks through 10,000 times. Yeah. And it works out the worst case scenarios. Kind of like, so you, we're talking about bell curve here. Correct. Where it's just the tail Correct. ends that, that are Correct. left. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So actuaries talk about a thing called VAR, value at risk. Uh, so at the tail, yeah. so 95th percentile, way down there, worst case scenario. Yeah. We then put that in the middle of the triangle okay. and say, if that scenario happened, what would the other three settings have to be to survive? Makes perfect sense. 
So that's what we do. Right. And that number at the moment is 10%. Right. So in other words, if an investor gave us $100, yeah. we give the Reserve Bank, not the investor, a lifetime, $10, right. which they supervise to back the guarantee. So that's the insurance bet. Correct. And, and that's our doomsday scenario. Yeah. Worst case scenario, we close the door. Yeah. We go to the Reserve Bank, we get our money out, and we give it back to the investors. Right. Gotcha. And it would be pretty, we've got probably got bigger problems if, if that scenario happened, I'm going to guess. At a 95% percentile on returns for the last 30 years, Yeah, I think we're all worried about something else. Yeah, get right with Jesus, <laughs> that's all I'm thinking. <laughs> totally. Wow, okay. And um, so what have we covered so far here, Ralph? So we're <laughs> freaking out now. <laughs> but we're talking about a black swan event, so that's okay. Um, so we've covered the problem. We've covered the current solutions. We've covered the, you know, the, the solution specifically that Lifetime you know, brings up. What, what do you think the market is doing? Like how, how is the market responding to this in New Zealand? Because I'm going to guess that there's still a bit of a memory, at least in the advisor community there is, of... Um, certain types of hybrid insurance policies that were around a while ago that just didn't really make sense at all. And, yes. and the, I'm wondering if there's a bit of a linkage between that, which is quite different, right? Do you want to talk me through that? Yep, um, indeed. Um, because we've had ended super for so long, annuities never really took off in New Zealand. Uh, Fidelity Insurance offered them, I think they had about, might have had five or eight million dollars invested in them. AMP okay. had, you know, the whole industry was about 50 million or something. Right. Okay. Um, and they were largely because they were based on the old European models, not the new European models, which right. were really harsh on people. Right. So almost the opposite of what we've, you and I have talked about, Darcy. If I bought an old European annuity, it was based on a tontine that goes back to the 17th century in France. Okay. Where you know, imagine you know four lovely ladies having lunch in their 80s at a restaurant. Right. They, they all. You lost me at the 80s bit. Okay. But <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> Um, but you, Sorry, you got me, Darcy. You got me, mate. Blushing. All right. <laughs> um, they all put ten dollars in an envelope, yeah, uh, and then they leave it, and they come back a year later, and only three people come for dinner or for lunch because one's died. So they've now got forty dollars to share amongst three people, not four. Gotcha. So if that person who didn't make it that day lost all their money, gotcha. Yeah. So the old annuities were very much the same style. Right. So you put a hundred thousand dollars in when you were sixty-seven. Yeah some reason you had an accident you died when you were 68 yeah. the insurance company kept the $100,000 right pretty sweet deal for them right? I reckon yeah. they had a lovely word they used to call it mortality credits right <laughs> thank you for your mortality <laughs> so getting all that that yucky stuff out was crazy yeah uh, so we've obviously done all that because that, that's kind of that was what abolished right was that from the industry or was that from without no, the you industry? can still buy the damn things is that right it's still, it's still out there oh, okay um, okay those sort of things also, your capital wasn't segregated, so it okay. went into the insurance company's balance sheet. One big pool, yeah. One big pool, yeah. you got lost amongst other liabilities, you pay tax at the insurance company's rate, just yeah. dumb stuff. Yeah, no, I, see, I still see these policies every now and then. I bet you do, Dustin. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, Nuts. what you're paying, what you're getting under these different events, it's like, yeah. Nuts. And we, sorry, I should probably just interject right here and say, none of this is financial advice, and <laughs> I'm not saying you should cancel it if you have that, but definitely get some advice. All right, um, going back to the, the whole market, but where we're at with the market right now, for this type of policy, like product, do you think that this is going to really catch on, or do you think it's going to be a slow burn? Yep. I know with the demographics, we've got a, a, the start of the baby boomers are just coming into full force right now. Yep. So, uh, am I correct in assuming that if they sold down the home, they release a bit of capital, they buy somewhere else? Yep. Is that kind of where a lot of the business is coming from right now? We, we've been surprised. I mean, the, the first issue is trust and confidence. Okay. You know, your early comments are spot on. The, the retired community has been had really bad time yeah. in the last 20, 30 years. So yeah. naturally, they're cautious and wary. Yeah. We're new, yeah. we're disrupting, and we're bringing new principles. Yeah, right. The two kind of water and oil. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so there's been a lot of uh, trust and confidence, and it's been really deliberate uh, yeah. when we set out a lifetime is to get the right people on the board. Okay. So yeah, we, that was the process for helping to you know, show the older community that these sort of people are involved. Yeah. So, so please don't worry. You know, we're here to do this properly. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe people are accepting that. Yeah. Um, lower interest rates have also meant actual fortnightly take home has been savaged. Mm. So there's an element of reality creeping in. I do need some supplementary income. And they they don't know much, but they know that they don't want to do anything risky. Correct. Right. Correct. But that's really the only other option, maybe for some of them, Correct. that they can see. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. 
the BEPS, if if it's right, uh, numeric driver. If if you know over three decades, the total annuity market in New Zealand was thirty, forty, perhaps no, not even fifty, but say say forty million dollars. Mm. We started trading in twenty sixteen. We we are now hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. So, so, something's going on. Something's got okay. <laughs> right time, right product, so, right. And it's just probably going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. I suspect, so. but it's not the ultimate solution, though, is it? Like this isn't, hey, you know, whatever you have, invest it with us, and this and this annuity. Correct. Is because that it's really just to act like a bit of a, a layer that sits on top of your your fixed cost that you have. You, this this can help you with that. This isn't your entire plan in one. Darcy, I'm not saying that right. So helpful. Yeah. All, all we're trying to say to retired people is. The, the WYSI investment stuff, I'm sure there's really cool people who can do that. Yeah. All we do is NZ Super and your lifestyle. Yeah. And we can tell from all the annual surveys, for some people the difference might be $100 a fortnight. Right, right. For others it might be $1,700 a fortnight. Gotcha. Work it out. Yeah. We'll do that bit. If you've got any capital after that, go find the WYSI people. Which makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So you're not really catering for one solution for everybody. This is going to be for a certain type of person. Just retirement income. And obviously it goes without saying, from my perspective, I think before considering something like this or listeners, your parents who might be considering something like this, <laughs> I, I still I think it would be great for them to get financial advice. Totally. Think, it kind of makes sense, right? Because they, there might be other stuff going on and it may or may not be 100% suitable for some people, right? I completely support the advice process and I think lifetime works best when it's advised. Okay, right. Would you say that... Uh, at least in the early stages, it could be perceived kind of like insurance, where it's not necessarily bought, it does have to be sold to a certain extent. Like, I know that you guys do your, your seminars and stuff like that, and advisors will, will probably be you know, yeah. a bit more yep. you know, specialized in that sort of teaching and educating yep. field one on one. No, but could, completely. Do you find that it's a, that's a, it's a real barrier? Think about it in two ways. You know, the, the insurance has to be sold uh, because it's an impost on your take home income for mm. a benefit at some un- point in the future. I really do get that, understand that. And, and, you know, getting people to protect themselves is not easy. You know, they're busy, they don't have a lot of disposable income. It's yeah. very, very real. Yeah. This is kind of the opposite. Okay. Because it delivers an immediate income benefit. Gotcha. Um, so so they can, it's actually a, a way more tangible because here, here's a bunch of money, and correct. oh, yeah, I just saw that money, and now it's next. Next twenty five years, I got, I got, yeah. They're, they're experiencing that benefit immediately. Yeah. So surprise, surprise, didn't anticipate this. Yeah. You know, more more than eighty percent of our, our total sales, uh, people who have bought us directly. Okay, is that right? Yeah. The website's pretty good. Okay. So is that? Is that mighty your, Jules. As exactly. Mighty Jules, your marketing man. No, he, he's an absolute well done, wizard. Jules, wherever you are, oh, we'd be lost <laughs> without him. <laughs> good on you. Okay. Well, now, is there anything else that you want to cover in the space, in, in particular around the future? Because uh, I don't know. I don't know what what the overall strategy is, but is this one of many potential innovations, or are, are there going to be other products that you, you you bring out? I hope I'm not speaking too soon, Darcy. But, but I think you heard uh, it here first. That's what this sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> the notion of insuring your retirement income and getting a guaranteed income just to cover daily expenses, I, I think, is, is is rapidly becoming a new category in New Zealand that's mm. becoming accepted. Okay, I, th- I think it's okay. Good. Um, but as we talked about before, there are so many New Zealanders today, even before KiwiSaver, you know, 300,000 yeah. have got their home in NZ Super. Yeah, that's right. That's really tough because we know there's a gap. That's right. So at Lifetime, we're trying to see if we reconstruct home equity in a different way Oh, mm-hmm. to help those people. All right. This sounds very interesting. Unlock some equity but not right. have to suffer large interest rates. Gotcha. And the last piece is... Um, you know, we talk about the word reference company. So, so we look to other companies that we think are doing well and learn from them. Okay. Uh, that company is a company called Challenger. Oh, from Australia. Australia. Yeah. We look at them lots. Good. And they've been hugely successful in yes. Japan. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so if those damn Aussies yeah. can do it in Japan, well, us Kiwis can too. Okay. So perhaps in the next two or three years, we might be able to take a disruption yeah. uh, to Japan. Fantastic. We, we've begun that process slowly. So kind of look, looking at the competitor instead of waiting for the, com- the competitor to come here, let's go where they are. Correct. Because I like that strategy. That's <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, this is, this is fascinating, and, I, and I, I, it smells like there's going to be some, some more discussions that we could potentially have in the future. Because that, that sounds really like those, those things that you mentioned sound like there's, um, there's a lot of uh, scope for innovation. There is. And again, it's, it's just when you think about fintech, um, sometimes it, 
it overlooks some areas or it goes into other areas better than others. But um, you can't really build anything new in this country without getting some new tools, right? Absolutely. It's going to be pretty darn difficult to innovate if we're stuck in old ways and using old tools. Absolutely. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah. Oh, we're very proud of Lifetime. There's a lot to do, Darcy, and I'm just looking forward to every day. Good on you. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Ralph. And is there, is there anything, any last parting wor words of uh, wisdom that you want to give us? Oh, wisdom might be hard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anything but, else? Uh, very grateful for the opportunity, Darcy. Yeah, um, j just to say that I think, you know, I completely agree with you, that the, the notion of innovation, I, I think it's a bit of ta been taken over by fintech. Mm. You know, innovation doesn't just have to be about delivery through new technological advances that are largely in, in the delivery of information space, mm. like information technology. Correct. We've come at it from a completely different space and, yeah. and said that, that the maths <laughs> that yeah. relate to how volatility is dealt with, yeah. the, the, the nature of the way mortality has been dealt with, yeah. doesn't have to be that way. Right. Let's okay. look at it through a different lens. Okay. So innovation in financial services just doesn't have to be about you know, the, the modern infrastructure, the nature and structure and delivery of data. Mm. It can be about the fundamental construct. Mm. You know, knock down some pillars and rebuild. I love that. Creative destruction. You know, it, there's got to be new thinking for, for the new world, right? So, yeah. So I, I think that's awesome. And I commend you for your work. Well done. Thank you, sir. Keep it up. Thanks again, Ralph. Cheers, Darcy. All right.